Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. We are here talking to Lorraine Carey and we are talking about her book, My Year with Nana and her at the end of her century. And um, in the previous segment, you were talking about this incredible history um, of, of your family um, and um, your research into that. And um, I would almost say the anguish. <laughs> when I heard the stories, I felt a sense of anguish, you know, um, whether it was, you know, your great grandfather being asked, you know, how, why are people leave by this Confederate Senator? Why are you leaving the South? Um, or how did you get all that land in kind of a, you know, suspicious way? <laughs> I mean, which is just so, I can't, I mean, I can't even imagine like the just confusion um, and rage, I would feel if someone were saying that, but that you can't, you have to check it anyways. Like there's a sense of, I have rage and I have to check that because mm -hmm. if I don't check my rage, I could be in serious danger. Mm -hmm. Then to his son who, um, has this beautiful biracial, um, fusion party, um, which then gets basically has a situation very much like the January 6th event where people come and overthrow um, to your grandma who had this kind of sense of inner power within her. I mean, and, and what I think is so beautiful about this whole thing, and here comes you, you know, the power of telling the stories. Mm -hmm. Mm. Right. Because if, 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 if this hadn't like who, this is a really powerful legacy of voices of history. And so you have the opportunity to tell the story of your family. Um, what, ha, I guess, what are your personal reflections on power? I mean, when you look at your family and what it's gone through. You know, I, I, um, I started writing years ago, years and years and years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I started with this memoir about going to St. Paul's School, um, published in 88, I think. Mm -hmm. And listening to you, what, what I discovered, I was always so afraid of radio or television interviews because I write in order to tell the story in a way that so I'm on this side of it and then there's this book and then you're on that side so it's like you have a little thing in between us <laughs> exactly. look at right. the book CJ <laughs> that's it that's it that's why I write yeah that's why I started writing because I mean I did an internship with with television news and I realized I did not like thinking while people were looking at me. Mm. I didn't, you know, I, my mother would always say, for God's sake, put on some lipstick or do something or, you know, get, get those bags. I still don't have concealer and it, believe me, the bags <laughs> work. They're like way worse than they were, you know, 30 years ago. But, but, but the, but I always learn from interviews and I've learned from you just this moment, listening to your thing, that part of what also was going on was the, uh, the passing down of rage. Mm. Oh God, I just got chills, wow. Yeah, you just, you just helped me see that. And the, the new field of um, epigenetics, mm. you know, that talks about what is passed through um, the, the cortisol in the mother that gets, that starts teaching the infant how much they should be nervous and worried and afraid and like all of, all of these emotions that we feel and have words for, we feel them before language as, as a, an electrochemical um, bunch of signals in our bodies. 
and those are passed on. You know, the, the, the biblical reference talks about the son and the son that gets, you know, of, of this son. The Native Americans talk about seven generations that will fit. All of the ancient wisdom found other ways to talk about epigenesis. And, and that's, that's a part that we're not putting into uh, Black history, immigrant history, Native history, and we're not putting it into white American history. Mm. Because those same people who came here, um, Resma, who wrote My Grandmother's Hands, Resma, I'm not losing mm -hmm. yeah. last name, yeah. talks about this. And it's always, always been in my mind that the people who brought you serfdom, plagues, um, punishments, which included cutting somebody open and taking their bowels, wrapping them on a spool so that they could see it as, I mean, the people who brought you this punishment came here and brought that trauma with them. Mm -hmm. Being a perpetrator. Being a perpetrator and a victim. Right. So that they, were, they never felt safe. All those people, mm. the prisons, who were impressed into boats and then came to the United States. Mm. Those people were here as well as the people who impressed them. Mm -hmm. Right? All of this idea of serfdom, of slavery, like that didn't come out of nowhere. Oh, I see. So I think what you're saying, so I think about the people who are coming from the Mayflower, right, who were persecuted for being, you know, for their religion, and they came here and then persecuted the violence, the perpetrate, you know, continue of violence of another just continued by taking slaves and continuing. It's like, so is that what you meant? Or did you mean? Yes. The people? Yeah, yes. okay. Yes. Yeah. And, and not just for the religious persecution, but um, people who came here because of poverty, mm -hmm. their own poverty, people who came here because it was their only shot, like all of that, plus the ambition, plus all of that brings its own trauma. Mm. That trauma gets embedded into your everyday life. If you don't think about it, deal with it. And they were trying to, they came up with a lot of enlightenment strategies, a lot of brilliant strategies against particular kinds of oppression, mm -hmm. but not others. Mm. So, so the laws they came up with for indenture, for instance, would still appall us. And as my mother says, if that's what you do to your own kids, well, God help everybody else, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so I hear that, but I'm also hearing in my own family, one of the things was like, we talk about family curses, mm. families who, mm. and basically these are ways of behaving mm -hmm. that are passed down, that are mm. um, maladaptive, maladroit, just generally mal, like hurtful in some way to the next generation. Mm. Um, or hurtful to the people themselves. My grandmother was very powerful. Um, her rage, however, um, and the fact that she was never able to handle what happened to her mother who died when she was six. Hmm. What happened to her father who got the money from those 500 acres and then lost it all in the depression. Mm. All that work, all that, like the shame. They also had great shame. Mm. And mm. that comes out, you know, Brene Brown talk, talks to us about all the ways that shame um, comes out in people's lives. So mm. that also had to do with my grandmother's trying to walk a very careful path mm. where you don't upset too much. You don't upset the rage. You don't upset the cultural stuff. 
you don't upset white people too much because when you upset white people, they kill you, right? Or or hurt you or make you lose your job. You don't upset. So, but but at the same, so she didn't do the kind of activist stuff that her father did and the people in Philadelphia who did the Republican Citizens Club or started the first black bank or started a black cemetery mm. outside the city called Eden, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Because little teeny black cemeteries during the um, that had started in the 17 and 1800s in Philadelphia were being dug up and God knows where the bodies were being put now, uh, in order to make way for um, expansion, mm -hmm. big expansion in Philadelphia in 18, uh, 19, um, 1800s, 19th century. So they started a black cemetery mm -hmm. so that all these little, you could have a, a place to inter our ancestors' bodies with mm -hmm. respect. Mm -hmm. And of course, the people in that area, that suburb, were furious when they found out what was happening mm -hmm. and tried to stop it. And Nana's father and um, the man he worked for, uh, George Henry White, who was the Black congressperson from North Carolina, the last Black congressperson in Congress who did not run again, 1902, because by that time, Jim Crow had succeeded mm -hmm. in getting rid of enough black voters so that he could never be voted in again. Wow. And he said when he left, so my, um, my great grandfather, Will Hagans, was his secretary. Wow. Did he help craft that first lynching, anti-lynching bill? that never got out of committee? I don't know, but I know he worked for George White when he was mm. writing it. And when George White left North Carolina and came to Philadelphia, mm. Will Hagen's followed mm. because he could no longer be a man there. He could no longer do, do the work they had been trying to do mm. in North Carolina. So they came to Philadelphia to do it. Okay, I want to go into the next segment because I this is bringing up, um, you know, idea of um, you know the continued conversation of of power and rage, and um, as I see it, like an ancestral collective trauma, right? And and now I think the next step is like, what do you do about it? You know, I have my own mixed position about it. You mm -hmm. know, your grandma, Nana had a position on it. You know, you, you had various people in your family that had, you know, collective power, individual power, when to speak up, when is it safe? I wanna talk a little bit more about collective versus individual power and how, um, you know, you're writing an individual story. You held up your book, right? But it's a mm -hmm. story of the collective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a bridging of both. And you have all these different expressions that are coming up. So I want to talk about that in the next segment. Um, we've you. been talking to Lorraine Carey about her book, My Year with Nana, at the end of her century. Thank you so much. Thank you.